The FDA could approve emergency authorization for Pfizer's COVID-19 vaccine as soon as today. But how did we get to this point? Recently, Wired asked one of the top scientists at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease just that and how we can make warp speed the new normal. The government agency worked with a drug company, Moderna, to help develop a vaccine. Adam Rogers, a senior correspondent at Wired, is behind the article. He joins us now with more. Um, Adam, so if a vaccine is approved by the FDA today, it will be one of the fastest scientific achievements in modern history. A lot of people are sort of wondering how were researchers able to pull this off? And there are some who think to themselves, well, wow, if they were able to do it this quickly for something that was so dire, so necessary, so needed, what more do pharmaceutical companies need to help with, you know, find ways to combat other things, be it cancer or HIV? Right. Well, so that's the that's that's the hope. Right. And like a lot of things in science, this seems like it happened in 20 minutes because all of our senses of time are all messed up because of the, how bad the last year has been. But also it took almost 20 years. Um, the, the reason that this went so fast was not because um, people had some magic high speed ability to deal with COVID-19 with this particular virus, but because SARS-CoV-2, which is the virus that causes COVID-19, comes from a family of, of viruses that affect human beings called coronaviruses. And those have been around for, those have caused two big um, outbreaks, pandemics in the last 20 years, SARS, the first one, and then MERS, you might remember those. So because of those, folks at uh, the Vaccine Re Research Center, um, at, which is part of NIH, which is the, the person who I talked to, um, runs, and all across the world, were studying those viruses. And specifically, this, this protein called the spike protein on the surface of the virus that helps it infect human cells. So when it turned out that this new disease, this COVID-19 that started to hit people in December of 2019, um, was a coronavirus, they were kind of ready. They had some scientific, uh, some scientific ability to, um, to do the analysis of that spike protein. And that's what we're seeing the benefits of now. So it's not actually sort of, hasn't be, been developed in such a short span of time as we, as we think, but they are using sort of new vaccine technology, I guess, if that's the right phrase. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, for sure. That's absolutely true. And I don't say that to denigrate the high speed and high pressure work that the researchers who were working on these new vaccines have done. What they were able to do in this case is, in addition to the kind of traditional uh, portfolio of technologies that make vaccines work, where you try to find a protein that the body's immune system fights or recognizes in the, uh, in the virus, and then you try to get the human body to make that protein in some way, and then, that, then the immune system starts to learn to attack that protein, and then it can fight the virus. That's sort of traditional. That's the classic way that vaccines work. In this case, the vaccines use what's called mRNA, which is a particular kind of genetic material. You know, about DNA, mRNA is another one of those. Um, and it in sort of makes a synthetic version of the mRNA that will code to make that spike protein. The mRNA is what the body reads to make proteins. Um, then it folds that mRNA in a very specific way in what's called a lipid, nano, uh, lipid nanoparticle, which is a good Star Trek sounding term, but basically means this little bubble of fat that holds the thing together because mRNA is really uh, fragile and gets it into the body so that the body learns, doesn't start to see the protein, it learns to actually make that protein and then learns to recognize it, the immune system learns to recognize it, which is really cool because you can do it fast. Um, the, what that does is it gives vaccine makers some real flexibility that they haven't had before. That's where the speed came in. If you can, if you can figure out what the infectious part of a, of a germ is, and then you can figure out how to make that, you can make the mRNA. If you get the right technology, the right fermenters and stuff to make the mRNA and hold it stable in a way that the immune system will see it, then you can do this for potentially any virus. Potentially you can do this for cancer. Potentially you can do this for all kinds of things that affect human beings. And that's what the, what the, um, the vaccinologists and the epidemiologists are really hoping for. They see the, um, the speed with which Moderna, which is the company that was working with um, the government scientists here, and also Pfizer and BioNTech, which are companies that are also making a mRNA-based vaccine, the speed with which they've been able to develop the vaccine, this specific, uh, this specific virus, means that maybe they can do that for all the viruses that potentially affect human beings, that they can lay some groundwork. And that's what John Mascola from the Vaccine Research Center was saying, that they hope they can lay the scientific groundwork for other uh, viruses and other things that infect human beings and then be ready in the same way that they were, in a sense, ready for COVID-19. 
So there are numerous, numerous types of vaccines that are being cre created from genetic vaccines to viral vector vaccines and protein-based vaccines. Uh, what is, how big of a deal is it if the first COVID vaccine is genetic? It's a huge deal. Um, it really makes a difference because this is, the, this is a kind of vaccine that's never been authorized or approved for human use. Moderna is a company that's never had a vaccine make it all the way through phase three trials to approval. Um, Pfizer, of course, is a big transnational pharmaceutical company, and they've got a lot of experience here, but BioNTech, the company they're working with, is not. So it suggests that new players can come into this industry, which is important because making vaccines is kind of an underloved field um, in, the, uh, in the world of making drugs because they're not huge money makers for pharmaceutical companies. And it might mean that, um, that, there's, a new, that there's a new technology that, that's sort of available to scientists, and that just hasn't happened in a long time. Um, and the reason I think that it's it's funny because there are people who are saying now that it actually took too long. There are some people who are complaining that if this was ready to go essentially in January or February, why didn't they start distributing it to people even then? So some of the beauty here is that now mRNA vaccines, that vaccine technology, as you said, has been now tested in human beings, has been um, rigorously tested for at least the kind of side effects that you can see within a few, couple of months, which was part of what the FDA laid out as a criterion for people for companies to submit their approval. Um, and it means that, um, that now they sort of know this works, or at least that it can work. Uh, and, and that's a huge deal because um, whenever there's a new, a, a new tool added to that toolbox, it makes it possible to help more people. Um, this is really fascinating to me because, you know, it could potentially signal um, not just a change in the way drug companies work, the way they, because they are companies, so I'm sure they have to sort of game out how much they spend on research, how much they spend on testing, uh, based on, and, and sort of figure out how long it, should, it would take to get a drug to market, but also the governing bodies, the FDA and other go governing bodies, and how they assess a drug. Um, you spoke to John Mascola. He's the director of the Vaccine Research Center at the Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. And you discussed everything from drug companies running their own trials to concerns over what a newly approved vaccine would mean for ongoing and future trials. What does he say the scientific community has learned from Operation Warp Speed? Well, I think the important thing there, and you identified it, is that they've learned some ways to work with these large companies and small ones in some cases um, to, to partner in an emergency. And that was something that they were, uh, were very um, intent on, that they'd be able to set up a framework that would engage the pharmaceutical industry as well as academics and scientists uh, who, who aren't in industry and government regulators and scientists in government. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to be like that. Like, you could imagine a world where the government ran the trials all on their own. You could imagine a world where, in fact, we had head-to-head -head vaccine trials against each other, which we still haven't seen, and where the, the actual trials that the vaccines all underwent that were run by the companies themselves were more aligned. They were pretty close to each other, but were more, com more comparable, the endpoints that those trials look at. And that's something that a lot of researchers are expressing some concern about, not because they think the vaccines won't work, but because they'd like to have more information about how to, how to distribute them, essentially, and to make sure that they're doing what we need them to do. Um, but what they learn with Operation Warp Speed is that certainly given a huge amount of money, which Operation Warp Speed spent, that they can co collaborate with um, kind of partners and industry and figure out what they need them to do. And those industry partners, given the right incentives, um, both scientific and humanitarian, and also you know, business incentives, can figure out how to, get, um, how to get a vaccine developed very quickly. Part of the reason that this is happening so fast, the reason that, as they keep saying, that if, if the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccine gets its emergency use authorization in the next few days in the United States, which seems likely to happen, that trucks are going to roll within days. They've been saying that people will be getting shots almost immediately because they've already made so many doses of vaccine in advance of the possibility that they were going to get that authorization because they've already put, Pfizer has put a massive logistical network in place to transport this pretty fragile and finicky vaccine that they're working with. It's got to be kept at very, very cold temperatures. Um, and uh, not everybody has the facility to use these, these ultra cold freezers. They're common in academia and science, but not so common in rural areas. So Pfizer's been building a huge network, invented a whole new kind of storage container to carry the vaccine doses. They've had to find the right kind of glass, all these things that in the ordinary way that drug, drugs of any kind, much less vaccines developed, would have essentially waited until this authorization or until a licensure 
um, to start developing. Well, how do we actually get it to people? They were doing all of that in parallel rather than in series. And, and it does mean that, um, you know, it's not clear that there are enough doses for as many people as who are going to need them as quickly as they will be. But some number of people, if this vaccine gets authorized, some number of people are going to be getting shots before the end of the year. That's astonishing. That's, that's a, from the time that this virus was discovered in human beings, which was December of 2019, to the time that human beings are going to be getting immunized against it in December of 2020. And that's never happened before. It's a, it's a real achievement. It's, uh, it's remarkable. It, it is remarkable, and it just shows you what, uh, what we as humans uh, can do, very smart people, when we have to. But from a scientific point of view, what does Mascola say is next? Uh, what has been remarkable, I think, Adam, is over the course, I mean, in the course of my lifetime, I remember growing up, and, you know, a, a lot of what we heard, a lot of what we saw in the news is that we, the United States, um, the West, other uh, countries, had pretty much solved disease, right? I mean, the big diseases that had killed, wiped out human beings for thousands of years were now a thing of the past. But increasingly in the last 15 or 20 years, it's not just coronavirus, it's MERS, it's uh, SARS, it's Ebola. We're hearing more and more about viruses um, and infections and pandemics that are occurring. And so what happens the next time around? Are we prepared for the next one? That's right. We uh, we solved so many infectious diseases. We failed to solve hubris. I think is what the mm. what the, the Greek poets would have <laughs> said. Right. I mean, there's always um, there's always another one around the corner, um, and especially a, a virus affects a human being. Um, a pandemic virus affects a society, and um, that that interaction, that dynamic, has been the hallmark of the last year because not all societies were affected equally, and not all people in American society were affected equally, have been affected equally, continue to be affected equally by COVID-19. So, what do we learn here? Well, we learned some new approaches and technologies for dealing with viruses in a in a medical way, in a in an end an end state sort of way, and that's really important. So, one of the things John Mascola said is now we know that well. Uh, a year ago, two years ago, it might have seemed financially and um, logistically impossible to spend the money and, and task the scientists to look at any one of the 20 of virus families that affect human beings most with the greatest effect um, and e take each one of those and do the same kind of groundwork on those that they did on coronaviruses because SARS had been so scary and because MERS had been so bad. Um, well, we could do that for all the 20 other families and then we could have something like the spike protein ready to go. Now, does it mean that they would be immediately successful the way it seems they have been with the mRNA, specific mRNAs for the spike protein right now? No, it doesn't. They could get it wrong the first time, but it would mean they'd be partially ready. And we used to think, well, that, that could cost billions of dollars. We could never possibly do that. Over 20 years, spend billions of dollars for 20 virus families. How could that be done? Well, now we know it can be done um, when we have to. Maybe we could do it as a way to be resilient against it, to be ready for it. Um, and more than that, we know that it's worth it because by some estimates, the pandemic will cost American society $16 trillion. So that's a pretty good turnaround just in, in terms of lives lost and it, problems with the economy and jobs lost. And um, I don't say that to be callous. You know, obviously what we're talking about are almost 300,000 human lives lost, a massive tragedy for the United States, millions of people sick, potentially with symptoms that could go on for months. That's a huge amount of debility, not to mention what's happened with the economy. This has been a real trial. Um, that we're still in. We're still in the midst of it. The worst is here now, not back in March, it turns out. Um, but we know that it's something that we can approach using the right kind of science, and we've seen a model. And what Mascola said is we can do that for other viruses, and I think that's really important. Um, what, what I'm not sure we have learned is how to approach it from a societal and public health um, direction where, where we aren't maybe necessarily always going to be able to say, well, look, in a year, there's going to be a, a very expensive drug that government dollars will pay for the development of, and that maybe pharmaceutical companies will be able to charge for anyway. We don't know. We still don't know how that's going to work. Um, President-elect Biden has said that it will be free to Americans. That wasn't always on the table. Um, and that's still in play. So Mascola set up um, at the Vaccine Research Center, Mascola is advocating setting up a, a, a um, an infra scientific infrastructure to look at those viruses, to do um, international drug trials. Um, once you have them, to, because setting up these trials is really hard. 30,000, 40,000 people in a trial is not always available. You need cooperation with other countries. That's another thing that we haven't done particularly well. 
Um, in the case of COVID-19, other countries have done a little bit better um, with those kind of trials, but there's no national, there's no international infrastructure to just stand them up immediately. Nobody knows how to turn on, to turn the key and have a, a, a massive drug trial get started. So my school is advocating that as well. And, and these are possibilities. These are things that now we know we can do. We've done them under, we, I say we, I'm just a reporter, right? But this American scientific infrastructure has, has done this, has responded um, in, a, in a way that all of us should really be proud of, I think, and other countries' scientific infrastructure as well. BioNTech's based in Germany. Um, you know, these are um, AstraZeneca and Oxford are, are in England. This has been an international effort. Um, and I, uh, I think, I hope we don't have to do it again, but now we know we can't. Adam Rogers, this has been a really interesting conversation. It looks like you're going to have an awful lot more to write about uh, in the future when it comes to science and various geekery, which is, uh, I think, <laughs> what your expertise are. Thank you so much. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks for having me.